Does free will exist? And what is will anyways? We're going to definitively answer that for you today. But please understand that this is an extremely advanced communication. Advanced, advanced, advanced. Very advanced. You're not going to understand this without many awakenings and without thousands of hours of profound contemplation to the nature of existence. This question is so much deeper than anybody has led you to believe. Recently, I've had a new level of awakening with a complete understanding of what will is. It's taken me over a hundred awakenings to crack this nut of what is will. So now I understand, and I'm going to communicate it to you, but what I'm going to communicate to you is not going to make sense to you unless you actually do all the work that I did to reach this level of understanding. But the point of this communication is to plant the seed in your mind that such understanding exists and it's possible, and it's not just some pipe dream. And these are not just speculations or theories of mine. You can become directly conscious of what will is and whether free will exists. And it's a lot more complicated than just a yes or a no to this question. I've spoken about this question a long time ago in the past, maybe four or five years ago, I released an episode about free will and uh, it was in the right direction, but but now I really understand what will is, and it's such a profound thing. So this episode is going to replace the old one that I have still up. All right, so where do we begin? What is will? <laughs> and does it exist? So this episode is advanced because it assumes that you've watched much of my previous content that I won't re-explain here. You have to understand some fundamental concepts that I've talked about, for example, about dualities, distinctions, how those work. Go check out my three-part series called Understanding Duality, part one, part two, part three. That will get you some of the foundation you need, some of the theoretical foundation to understand some of the things I'll be quickly saying here. But here's the bottom line, is that, as I've said many times before, Reality is an infinite field of consciousness, which is imagining distinctions. Every thing that you think exists is a distinction within consciousness. That this field of consciousness is making. Distinctions like me versus you, you versus the world, you versus other. Humans versus animals, matter versus energy, matter versus antimatter, black versus white, big versus small, reality versus fantasy. These are all distinctions that are being imagined and dreamed up by universal consciousness, which is what you are. You are universal consciousness, but you're not fully aware of that yet. You think you're a human. So human is a distinction within universal consciousness. You see that? Now, what does this have to do with free will? Well, you see, freedom is a distinction you're imagining within this field of consciousness. So you're imagining freedom on the one hand, and then it's opposite, which is a lack of freedom on the other hand, or in other words, you might say constraint or something like determinism. You might hold that as the opposite of freedom. Furthermore, you're imagining something like will and then the opposite of will, not will. That's also a distinction you're creating. And you're imagining a distinction between control versus lack of control or 
we might also frame it as controller versus the thing that it is controlling. Controller versus controlled. So when you're asking this question, does a human have free will? What you're basically doing is you're taking a universal field of consciousness, the entire universe, you're subdividing that into a part, such as a human, this human here, but not that human there, or not that chair, or not that table, or not the planet Earth, or some other thing. And then you're asking the question, okay, so if I'm just this little part of the universe, who controls that part? Do I control my own part? And how does my personal control over my little part of the universe relate to the universe at large? Do I control myself or does the universe control me? That's another way to frame the question. On the one hand, it seems like the universe controls me. Because like, for example, I don't control my DNA. Ordinarily, that's how we think. I don't control when I was born. I don't control who my parents were. I don't control when I get hit in a car crash by somebody else. So in that sense, I don't have control. On the other hand, I seem to have control over the universe. I can steer the steering wheel of my car and cause my car to move in different directions. I can choose to go to the gym or to be lazy and not go to the gym. I can choose to get married and have children or not. I can choose which food to eat or not. And in this way, it seems like I'm controlling the universe. In fact, I could build my own house if I wanted to. That would be me manipulating and controlling the universe. So do humans control the universe or does the universe control humans? Well, of course, it's not a simple either or choice. Something much more nuanced is going on here. I want you to appreciate how, how delicate and sensitive this question is. The problem here is that the ego mind fundamentally wants to believe that it is in control. That is the function of the ego mind. That is the function of the small human self-identity, the lowercase u identity. You need to feel like you're in control of at least some portion of your life, because if you don't, notice what happens. There's actually emotional consequences. You get depressed, you get frustrated, you get angry, you get emotional. You start to feel like a victim in life. And there are some people in life who seem to have a lot of control over life and their own selves. And then there are other people who don't have a lot of control and they're like helpless victims. They can't do anything. They can even barely motivate themselves to wake up in the morning and, and go to work because they're so out of control. Now, the trick here, though, is that it's all about how you define what you is. You see, ordinarily, when we say, well, do I have control over life? We just take the you part of that question for granted. But on that question hinges everything, hinges the whole answer. For example, science cannot answer this question because science doesn't have a deep enough appreciation of the relativity of the you identity. Science just assumes that, well, you is a given. You means you're a human. Not so fast. What if there's other definitions of what you is? Larger definitions. So you see, the problem is that if we have, consider for a moment, the whole universe, everything that could ever possibly exist, everything. If you're going to define you as any subset of that, if you're a little human within the universe, if there's a distinction in your mind between you and the world, if you think you're separate or different from the world, 
or if you think that you're separate or different from others, other conscious agents in the world, see, you're defining yourself as something less than the entirety of the universe. If you do that, by definition, you cannot have control over the entire universe because you're a portion of it, not the whole thing. You are like one molecule within a, a hurricane. If the universe is the whole hurricane, a human is like one molecule or one particle flying around. And in that sense, it seems like the universe and the world controls you even though you might struggle to control sometimes your own trajectory, the reality is, is that the majority of your trajectory in life is not controlled by you. The planet is orbiting the sun. The sun is orbiting some other galaxy or the center of the Milky Way. And how much control do you have as a human over that process? <laughs> None. So you see your control is very localized within the whole universe. But that's only if you define yourself as that little human you. If you assume that that's a physical fact, an objective fact, but what if it isn't? What if identity is a metaphysical thing, not a physical thing, and that it's relativistic in that you can change what you identify yourself to be. So if you change your identity from that of a human to that of the entire universe, if somehow you could make that shift in your consciousness, then that would change the whole question and how you look at this question and what the answer is. Because if we take the universe as a whole and we ask the question, who controls the universe as a whole? You can see that it's a very interesting and a different kind of question. Because when you're considering some part of the universe that is not the whole, then you can always appeal to something outside of that part as a controller of that part. So literally, what controls your physical XYZ coordinates in physical space? It would be the motion of the planet Earth and the Sun around the center of the Milky Way. And since you define yourself as not the Earth and not the Sun and not the Milky Way, that means you don't actually control your XYZ coordinates in space. You control a tiny portion of it, but not the majority of it. Because even as I was sitting here talking already, Scientifically speaking, you and I have moved through space, XYZ coordinates. Our XYZ coordinates have moved, even though we're sitting here not moving. The Earth and the Sun have all moved hundreds and maybe thousands of kilometers just in the last few minutes as I've been talking. And you don't control that because you don't define that as being part of what you are. But see, what's interesting is that if you expand your idea of what you are, to becoming the entire universe, and you ask the question, well, who controls the entire universe? See, now you can't make an appeal to something outside of the universe controlling the universe. Because the universe, the way we're defining it here, is this elastic notion which is to totalistic. It's all-encompassing. The entire universe. Everything that could possibly exist. Universe with an uppercase U. So, who controls the universe? Well, obviously, Nothing outside the universe can control the universe because the universe has no outside. Because outside and inside itself is a distinction imagined by the universe. The universe being an infinite field of consciousness. Since the universe has no outside, only inside, everything by definition is inside the universe, and it has no outer edge, it expands to infinity, that means the only thing that can control the universe is itself. The universe is self-controlled.
Because you see, the notion of controller versus controlled is a dualistic notion that requires that you subdivide the universe into at least two parts, the controller and the controlled. The controller is one part controlling some other part. So if I was a puppet or a marionette, the puppet would be the controlled and the guy controlling the puppet, he would be the puppet master, the controller. But you see, that assumes that there's actually a fundamental distinction between the puppet master and the puppet. Don't take that distinction for granted as a given. It's not a given. That distinction itself is relativistic. In other words, it only exists if you imagine that it exists. What if we take the puppet and the puppet master as being one object? Who controls the puppet then? Well, you see, even that question doesn't really make sense because to say who controls the puppet, to even ask that question already assumes that the puppet is separate from the puppet master. So the question truly is something like, who controls both the puppet and the puppet master at the same time? Because they're one unit. And the answer is, of course, that it controls itself. So if you identify just as the puppet, which is the human body, then there is something controlling you. But if you identify as the entire thing, then there's nothing controlling you but yourself. So understand that just to ask the question of who controls me or who controls the universe is already a dualistic question. It sneaks in a dualistic metaphysics without recognizing that it's doing so. Similar, a similar kind of logic applies to the notion of freedom because we're going to be talking here about free will, which means we have to wonder what is freedom. Freedom is a much more profound idea than most people give it credit for. Most people have no idea what freedom is. They've never thought about it deeply. Freedom is also a duality. Notice, some things you think are free, other things you think are not free. How do you distinguish between those two? What defines what freedom means? What does it even mean to say that anything in the universe is free? You might say, well, Leo, freedom just means that I get to do whatever I want. Well, but under this definition, nothing is free. You can't jump 50 feet high. You're not free to do that. You can't teleport to some other planet in the universe by snapping your fingers. You're not free to do that. So what does freedom really mean? And again, this question implicitly assumes a duality because if you say that you're not free, then you have to blame your lack of freedom on some constraint that is outside of you, that is not self-imposed. Because you see, if I say you can jump 50 feet high and you say, no, Leo, I can't. I would say, why not? And you would say, well, it's not because of my choice. I'm not choosing to be limited in this way. I was just born in this limited fashion. I was born as such a creature that it cannot jump 50 feet high. That's just how I am. Those constraints were put upon me by the universe at large, not by my own free will. I didn't choose to be this constrained. Something outside of me is constraining me. In other words, for example, you might say physics is constraining me. Physics is limiting me. The Earth's gravitational field is limiting me from jumping 50 feet high. Now, if I was on the surface of Mars, maybe I could jump 50 feet high. Or some other smaller planet like Pluto. 
maybe you could. And see there we would say, aha, so it's the Earth's fault. It's the Earth that is preventing me from jumping that high, because if I lived on Pluto, I could jump that high. So obviously it's the planet that's at fault here. And it's not me who's doing it. But again, notice that the, the word me, that's the identity again, the you identity, me, you, I, all this is the same thing. We're talking about how you identify yourself. So how you identify yourself here is crucial. The whole question hinges upon your identity. So if you identify yourself as not the planet, then you could say the planet is limiting you and taking your freedom away. On the other hand, again, if you expand your identity to include the entire universe, now we can ask the question, is the universe as a whole, is it free? Is it free to behave however it wants? That's a very profound question. I want you to contemplate that by yourself, to appreciate its profundity. Because again, what I want you to notice is that when you ask that question, notice when we're talking about universe as a totality of all things, of all possibilities, that means, again, it has no outside. So you can't appeal to something outside the universe to constrain the universe's freedom. So you might say, well, Leo, the universe as a whole is constrained by the laws of physics because there's a certain gravitational constant. There are other physical constants that scientists talk about. There's a sort of a fine-tuning problem that scientists talk about. And, you know, the physical laws and maybe even the logical laws of the universe are so established as to constrain what it can be and how it can work. But see, if you say that, you're not thinking deeply enough. Because, again, now, see, what you're doing is you're, you're defining the universe as something that's separate from, distinct from, the physical or logical laws which are constraining it. In this case, again, you're, you're creating a sort of a duality and you're not seeing that you're creating this. But my notion of a universe, the proper notion of a universe, includes everything, including the physical laws and the logical laws. So now you have to ask yourself, are the physical and logical laws themselves free? What is constraining them? What is defining them? What's holding them in place, so to speak? And if you say, well, there's some sort of metalogical or metaphysical laws which are holding it in place, you're just pushing the problem down one level. You're not really addressing the issue. You have to see that your metalogical laws and your metaphysical laws are also going to be all part of what we're calling universe. The universe has nothing outside of it, no other to itself. It's a unity. And when you realize that, then what you realize is the universe must control itself. The universe must define itself and set its own limits. If the universe is setting its own limits, then truly, in the absolute sense, the universe is free to be however it wants. Because there's nothing outside the universe to tell the universe how it has to be. There are no policemen or judges outside the universe. This is such a radical notion that there is not even anyone outside the universe who could judge whether the universe exists or not. In other words, for the universe to tell itself that it exists, or rather for the universe to exist, is nothing other than for it to tell itself that it exists. Because there's nobody to check whether the universe is being honest with itself. You see? The universe is self-defining, self-creating, self-constraining. But if it's self-defining and self-creating and self-constraining, that means it can define, create, or constrain itself however it wants, including having no constraints whatsoever. In other words, the universe is totally free. Free in the absolute sense. Freedom with a capital F. You might say, but Leo, what does all this have to do with free will? So here's what my, my recent awakening revealed to me, specifically on the issue of will and what it is. 
If you become infinitely conscious that you are the entire universe and your identity, your finite human identity expands to occupy the infinite scope of the whole universe, what you will realize is that since the universe is completely sovereign and has no outside, it imagines all of its own constraints and it defines itself and its identity as the universe or as something less than the universe, like a human or a kangaroo or a table or a chair or whatever. And as such, from that highest level of infinite consciousness, the universe is an infinite mind which wills itself into existence. In other words, everything that happens in the universe is the universe's will. Physical, material manifestation is the crystallization of the universe's will. Will with a capital W. What I'm saying is extremely profound. I'm saying that all material objects are identical to will. This is a, a radical idea. Because ordinarily, us humans have thought of, of will as something that human minds possess. And human bodies possess will. We might say the human body or an animal body possesses will, but a rock does not possess will. A chair is not capable of will. And so on. We don't usually ascribe will to physical objects. We ascribe will to ourselves. But you see, that's what this sneaky ego mind is doing. Because the ego mind's function, its whole reason for existence is to believe that you, this limited finite identity, has control over its environment to some degree so that you can manipulate that environment to survive. You see? But again, just like we do with love, we confuse our human notions of will with a universal metaphysical will that the entire universe possesses. So humans mistake their personal preferences, likes and dislikes of material objects, and they call that love. If you like it, you call it love. If you don't like it, you call it hate, the opposite of love. And we think that that's all that love boils down to is these kinds of biased emotions on behalf of living organisms. But that's not really what love is. I've discussed love um, in depth in other episodes. Go check out my episodes called What is Love? Part 1, Part 2. That explains that. I won't recapitulate that here. Um, but see, an analogous problem is happening with will. What's happening is that universal will, the will of the entire universe, is being severely limited when an ego mind grabs hold of it and only considers it in a biased manner in terms of what is my will? What is my portion of the universe's will? That's really what you're concerned about as a human, as an ego. You don't care about the will of the entire universe. You don't even care about the will of other beings and inanimate objects, you only care about your personal will because all you care about is how to manipulate reality long enough to survive. That's all you care about because of how you've defined yourself as a finite human. If your self-definition is very, very finite, by necessity, what that results in is a crippling of the universe's infinite will into that little portion of will that you think you have as an ego mind. You can manipulate small local portions of the universe by turning the steering wheel in your car, changing the radio station, things like that. Making a few decisions here or there. 
and you feel like you're uh, like a like a leaf blowing around in a giant hurricane it's hard for you to control yourself or maybe a better example here would be not a leaf but uh more like a bird imagine a little hummingbird in the middle of a giant hurricane it can control where it's flying but its ability to control where it flies is severely limited because the forces of the larger hurricane are completely overpowering the forces of its wings and so this poor little hummingbird is, is, is tumbling up and down and hitting trees and, and stuff like that. It can't control itself very well. That's a great description of what your life is like, isn't it? Isn't that what it feels like? Every day you wake up and you struggle to manipulate your life to get it to feel good for you, to get positive emotions out of it. And you struggle and struggle all day long. And at the end of the day, you're tired, you're frustrated, you're angry, you're upset, you're depressed, you're miserable because things didn't go your way. You're like that little hummingbird in the middle of a hurricane. And then sometimes, occasionally, you have a good day and things go your way. Everything goes your way and then you're happy. But then the next day, you struggle and then the hurricane blindsides you and hits you into, into a tree. And you're struggling, 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 struggling. It's exhausting to struggle like this, to live like this. And you tell yourself, well, but Leo, how else could it be? I'm just a little hummingbird in the middle of a hurricane. That's all, that's that's just that's just physics. That's just how things are. But consider, maybe that's not how things really are. Maybe that's a function of how you've defined yourself. Maybe you're not truly that hummingbird. Maybe you've tricked yourself into believing that you're the hummingbird, when actually you're the entire hurricane, including the hummingbird who's in the hurricane. See, that would be a, a radical shift in your identity, in your self-definition. And you might say, well, Leo, so what if I change my definition? It doesn't change anything. In a certain sense, it doesn't. It doesn't necessarily give the hummingbird more control over itself. But on the other hand, remember that you've changed your definition of what yourself is such that you're no longer identifying just as the hummingbird. So in a sense, you actually have increased your capacity for self-control just by expanding what you believe you are. You have a larger perspective. Your situation has been so recontextualized, go see my episode called Understanding Recontextualization. Your situation has been so recontextualized that now if you look at the entire system, the hurricane and the hummingbird in the hurricane, you see the entire system moving with a certain intelligence and a certain higher purpose. And now you no longer feel like you're just a little hummingbird that is struggling against these evil forces outside of you because you're, you're the entire system. So it's like that. So, as I've said before, the entire universe is not a physical system, it's a mental system. It's a field of consciousness, it's a universal mind. Universal mind has infinite will at the highest level. So what I'm telling you, I'm not just telling you some philosophical mumbo jumbo here, what I'm saying is that if you become infinitely conscious, which is possible to do, if you are fully awakened, what you'll realize is that literally Every single thing happening in your life was your own creation and is the function of your own infinite will. Or in other words, if you realize that you're God, you'll realize that everything is God's will, including the chair you're sitting on. Everything. All physical objects are manifestations and identical to God's infinite will. God being universal mind. If you became infinitely conscious, you could materialize any physical object into existence that you wanted to. This sounds rather outlandish to claim, but nevertheless, you can become directly conscious of this. But there's a trick. There's a very deep trick here, so be careful. Because it might sound like, oh, Leo, that's awesome. Show me how to become infinitely conscious. And then when I get that, then I will be able to do whatever I want. I will be able to please myself with, with 
all sorts of creature comforts and manifest millions of dollars and fast cars and beautiful women and other things like this. <laughs> but you don't get how profound this is. You're not going to be able to do that. And the reason that is, is because when you reach the levels of consciousness that I'm talking about at which infinite will exists and everything is the manifestation of infinite will, your ego, the closer you get to that point of infinite will, the less ego you have. The less ego you have, the less you identify with being a human. The less you identify with being a human, the less you're attached to your personal needs and biases. The less you care about manipulating reality, the less you see problems with how reality is working. See, if your ego is very dense and you're not very conscious, you believe that the world is evil. You believe that there's a lot of wrong stuff in the world that needs to be changed. Why do you believe that? Because you need the world to suit you to suit your survival. Because you care about your survival because you're needy and you're selfish. But as you raise your consciousness and you approach closer to God consciousness and awakening, the self and the ego melts away more and more until when you reach the highest point, there is nothing of it left. There's no more self left. There's no more neediness left. There's no more attachment left. There's no more biases left. You literally don't care if you live or die anymore. You certainly don't care about money. You don't care about sex. You don't care about your children. You don't care about your friends. You don't care about your family. You don't care about anything because none of it matters because at that level of consciousness, all of it is imaginary and there's no difference between one thing or another thing. Nothing is better than anything else because everything is equally great because all distinctions are imaginary and you're conscious of that. When you're fully conscious of how all distinctions are imaginary, that is precisely what gives you infinite will because infinite will is just imagination. You're an infinite mind and an infinite mind has complete control over itself because it's completely sovereign, because it's absolute, because it has no outside, because it has no difference between an inside and outside because it's so conscious, it recognizes that everything it thought was outside of itself is actually just parts of itself that it was dissociated from. So when you integrate all of your dissociations and there is literally no more distinction of other than you, you become God and you become absolutely sovereign in your power to manifest whatever reality you want. Now, again, your mind here is going to jump in and say, aha, Leo, so I can use this to make a better life for myself. <laughs> and the answer is no. <laughs> if you think that way, you're still being selfish and you're looking at this from the point of view of the ego because you actually believe that there's something wrong with your life. There's nothing wrong with your life and there's nothing wrong with reality when you're absolutely conscious. When you're at this highest level of consciousness that I'm talking about, you realize that reality always was absolute perfection. And therefore, it's not that you grab hold of God's infinite will and then try to use that power to benefit yourself or even others. What actually happens is a very counterintuitive thing is that when you become that conscious, the only thing that happens is a, is a surrender, a profound surrender. You completely surrender to your own will. Because even the idea that there's a you and there's a God and it's God's will that is controlling you and that you must somehow obey God's will, even that you see is a duality. You're framing it as though God is controlling the human. It might sound like that's what I'm saying, but that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying much more profound things than that. What I'm saying is that the human is God. They're identical. When that identity is actually recognized, what happens is the human disappears. There's only the God. The human surrenders to the God so fully that the human melts away and, and disappears like it never existed because the human was always imaginary. And then only the God remains. And as the God, what you realize is that you don't need to change or control anything. You don't need to manipulate anything because your will is already perfectly manifest as whatever you see as whatever is happening. 
And so you surrender any notions you have about changing the flow of your life to make it better. So very paradoxically, you don't make life better by manipulating life at this highest level. You make your life better simply by surrendering to however life is flowing because you recognize that however it's flowing is the best possible way that it could flow because God's will is never anything less than perfection. And God's will is your own will. So ultimately, when you fully realize that you are God, what happens is that you accept the fact that everything that has ever happened to you in your life and everything that is ever happening or will ever happen is your own will made manifest. Nothing has ever happened against your will. It was the ego that believed that it was the ego that was denying that it was God, not recognizing itself as God. Therefore, the ego thought there was something wrong in the world because the ego was afraid, the ego was biased, and so forth. But when you reach God consciousness, all those fears and biases melt away, and you're left with just perfection, the infinite perfection and intelligence of God's will. So what is will? Will is absolutely every physical thing that is occurring or has ever occurred in your life. Literally, this physical stuff is will. But it's not recognized as such by human ego minds because they're not conscious enough and they're too selfish to see it as will. Because we think of this as material stuff, but it's not really material stuff. This is mind stuff. All material things are mind stuff. Just a denser, stronger form of mind stuff than the human mind stuff that we ordinarily use to dream up fantasies about Santa Claus and unicorns and things like that. But there's no fundamental distinction between a unicorn and a table or a chair or the planet Earth. Those differences are something your mind is imagining. Those are differences, distinctions, imagined within the mind of God. So something extremely paradoxical happens when you reach God consciousness. What you realize is that it's not that there is no such thing as free will. A lot of spiritual teachers and non-dual teachers will just tell you that, oh, all of the egos desires to mean, manipulate are just narcissism and uh, there the ego isn't even real therefore the ego has no control over anything this is not quite correct because this paints uh, too blunt of a picture it, it paints a misleading picture in the mind of the student about what will really is because it 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 basically gives you the false idea that will doesn't exist like if you ask a scientist does will exist a scientist will say no and that's precisely false. It's not that will doesn't exist. It's actually 180 degrees the opposite of that. It's that everything is infinite will. You might say, well, Leo, what's the difference? There's actually a profound difference. So ultimately what you realize in the recent awakening that I had is I became so conscious that I became conscious of how I was willing my entire body and my entire reality into existence. And I was fully conscious of how I was doing that. In other words, when I'm moving my fingers right now, my hand, I can actually tap into a consciousness of how this, as the entire universe, now not as a human, but as the entire universe, this hand is being moved with a perfect intelligence. Absolute perfection staggering intelligence is going into the movements of this hand. Now, is Leo controlling this hand? That's the illusion. That's the illusion I was under for most of my life when I believed I was Leo. But as my sense of self expanded to that of the entire universe, now it's not that Leo is moving the hand using his will. And it's not that will doesn't exist. It's that universal will 
God's will is moving this hand perfectly. And I can become so connected to God's will that I literally merge into God's will. And then my movements, it doesn't be, it's not like I'm a zombie anymore. You might think, oh, you know, removing the ego just makes you a zombie. No, 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 no. <laughs> it doesn't make you a zombie. It makes you God. It makes you infinitely conscious and intelligent of the flow, the intelligent flow that is guiding the entire universe. And you and this body are just part of that entire infinite flow. You are an infinite flow, a flow of infinite intelligence. This is not something you're using your logical mind to grab onto because the logical mind itself cannot grasp onto this because the logical mind is finite, it's not infinite. So this is not going to make scientific sense. If you're trying to make sense of this scientifically or logically, it won't work because all of your logic and your science and your language and your thoughts are all dualistic. This only works with pure non-dual consciousness. There can't be any separation between you and God, you and the world, you and the universe, you and other creatures and animals. It all has to be one. You have to recognize it all as one totality, as the universe, as the field of consciousness that you are. And then the most astounding thing will happen is that you will realize that everything is a manifestation of your will and it's absolutely perfect. And you don't need to struggle so hard anymore to manipulate things anymore using your finite ego mind. Now you can flow using universal mind, using the, intel the intelligence of universal mind. You can tap into that. It's like surfing a wave. The wave will overpower you if you try to go head up against it. The way you surf a wave is that you align yourself with the wave such that you're riding on the on the edge of the wave at just that perfect balancing point where the wave can push you forward but it's not going to be too much to overwhelm you and drown you and then you learn to surf on that wave and you actually become part of that wave you and the wave are one there's no distinction between surfer and wave anymore and the whole thing is just one intelligent flow, balancing itself, regulating itself, controlling itself, defining itself, creating itself, willing itself into existence. And then what you recognize is that, ah, my entire life, because I've identified as being something smaller than the whole universe, I had to struggle against the universe. And that's why my life felt like a grind, like a struggle. And that's why I was so emotionally dysfunctional and neurotic and I was depressed and angry and emotional and jealous and petty and all this sort of stuff because I was fighting against myself. I was the universe improperly defining itself as something less than the universe, some part of the universe. I didn't fully accept and embrace my full universal identity and therefore I had to be in struggle with myself all the time and that was exhausting and it led to illness in me and it led to confusion, frustration, depression, suicidal ideation, and things like this. And it wasted an enormous amount of energy. I was interfering with myself the whole time. That's what you realize. You realize that the ego is a self-interference pattern. It gets in its own way. The ego tells itself that it can control more of reality if it just clings harder. Then the ego will get everything it wants. If I can just cling more, if I can cling more to sex, if I can cling more to my family, if I can cling more to material objects, if I can cling, cling more to money and my job, then I should have a better life. That's what it seems like, but it doesn't work. It doesn't work because the whole thing is predicated upon a lie. That you are something that needs to cling to other things. To possess other things. But when you realize that you are the entire universe, do you need to cling anymore to money or to family or to people or to sex or to whatever? No, because you're conscious that you're the entire flow. Therefore, there is no more clinging. 
And when there's no more clinging, that is actually the thing that frees up a lot of energy within you to then be at your peak potential as a human. Because now you've gotten out of your own way. Now, rather than using your finite intelligence and will, now you're aligning yourself instead with your true intelligence and true will, which are infinite and universal. So it's not about clinging or manipulating reality more. It's about surrendering those attachments in a very counterintuitive way. You surrender all those, and then you flow with the highest intelligence and the highest will, which is nothing other than your own will. You're just recognizing your own highest will rather than the petty little human will that you used to believe you had. You see how this works? So don't let spiritual teachers or scientists or, or whoever convince you that will isn't real, that will is some hocus-pocus stuff. <laughs> If anybody tells you that will isn't real, they're not conscious of themselves as God, because God is infinite will. Universal mind wills itself into existence because it has no constraints. What would constrain universal mind? What could tell it what to do? You might say physics could, but it can't because universal mind imagines physics. You might say, well, logic could, but then you realize universal mind imagines logic. And then you might say, well, some other universe could, but then you realize all other universes are imagined by universal mind. And then you say, well, some other mind might. What if there's some other mind outside of universal mind? And then you realize universal mind is infinite. It includes all other possible minds. Therefore, there is no other mind that is able to control it or to constrain it in any way. And this is the power of God when you realize this. This is how God is able to create itself. The reason God is able to do the impossible, which is to create itself from nothing, is simply because it imagines what is possible and what is impossible. Therefore, for universal mind, nothing is impossible. Even the notion of impossibility is something that is imagined by universal mind. <laughs> you see, so literally nothing is impossible from God's point of view. Therefore, God is able to just will anything it wants into existence because that's the power of infinite consciousness. That's the power of recognition of yourself as absolutely one and sovereign. Oneness is such a profound thing that oneness is omnipotence. Do you see that? People don't recognize the, the profundity of what oneness means. They hear oneness that everything is one. And they say, oh yeah, that sounds all right. That sounds plausible. You might even accept that as a physicist. But no physicist understands what oneness really means. Oneness means you have infinite power to manifest absolutely anything you imagine. That's what oneness means. If you truly grasp what oneness is. Of course, this level of grasping that I'm talking about cannot just merely be conceptual or at the level of belief or ideology or physics or language. This has to be absolute infinite consciousness. You have to become completely conscious of yourself. That means you have to be conscious of how you constructed the entire universe. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> That's not easy to do. You're not going to do that through a little bit of meditation. You're not going to do that through a little bit of self-inquiry. You're not going to do that through some Buddhist practices. You're not going to do that through a little bit of yoga. I'm talking about superhuman levels of consciousness that are completely outside of the realm of anything you can possibly imagine. But nevertheless, you can experience this and you can reach these stages of consciousness. And I've talked about how to do that in other episodes.
So we've answered the question of what is will. So you might ultimately ask, well, does Leo, so are you saying that God, you're saying God has infinite will. So are you saying God has infinite free will? Is God's will free? If I was God, could I do anything I wanted to? Would there be any constraints on what I could do, what I could imagine? There is one constraint, and it's an absolute constraint, and you're not going to like it. The only constraint on God's will is that it must be absolute love. Because at that highest level, everything is one. When everything is one, oneness is absolute love. God is love, as I've discussed elsewhere. I won't re-explain that here. So if you're confused about the love issue, go go watch my episodes about love. What is love? Where I explain that. Um, but uh, but if you understand what I what I talked about there in those episodes, then see now we're going to connect love and will together, and freedom. So, on the one hand, it might seem like I'm saying that God can just sit around and imagine whatever stupid shit it wants. Because it's totally free. But it's really not totally free. Because if you were infinitely conscious, you wouldn't be sitting around imagining stupid shit to titillate yourself or to entertain yourself. What you would do is you would give all of your will towards the manifestation of infinite love. You would materialize infinite love. That's the only thing that would make sense at that level of consciousness, selflessness, and intelligence. The highest intelligence cannot be anything other than love. Love, intelligence, consciousness, truth, goodness, God, these are all absolutely identical. Not metaphorically, they're literally identical. They cannot be distinguished from each other. Therefore, if you're at the highest intelligence level, if you're at the highest level of love, if you're at the highest level of will, where you have literally omnipotence, all that omnipotence is used towards a singular purpose, which is the manifestation of the entire material dream that you're a part of. So beware the trap of thinking that you can grab hold of God's powers and use them towards any selfish purposes. You can't. You might even be tempted to do something like this. You might say, well, Leo, like, let's say... I want to do something nice for somebody else. Like, let's say my mother has cancer. And if my mother has cancer, wouldn't it be nice if I was able to heal her? And maybe, Leo, maybe if I reach this infinite level of consciousness that you're talking about, an infinite love and infinite intelligence and will, I will have the power to heal my mother's cancer. And it won't be for my own selfish amusement. You know, it won't be like asking for sex or asking for a million dollars. This is me trying to cure my mom. What can be better than that? What can be more loving than that? So surely I should be able to do that, right? And the answer will be, it's not up to you. It's up to whatever is the highest love. So if the highest love means that your mom will be cured of cancer, then she will be. And if the highest love means she shouldn't be cured of cancer, then she won't be. And nothing you can do will change that, nor should you want to change that. So your job is not truly to cure your mother of her cancer. Your job is to become infinitely conscious and to surrender yourself to the flow of, of infinite intelligence and love, whatever that is. You surrender yourself to God's will so profoundly that you're not even surrendering anymore. You become God's will. And you don't tell God's will what's right. There's no improving upon God's will. It's absolutely perfect. So if that perfection requires the death of your mother to a horrible cancer, then you accept that and you're happy about it because that's the highest good. Now, this is very difficult for most human egos to do precisely because you're so attached to your mother in this case and you believe that actually, no, Leo, it would be better if my mother survived. See, you're not humble enough to actually surrender to the fact that maybe it's best if your mother died. You think you know better. 
because you're biased, you're attached, you're needy, you got an ego, you're afraid, you suffer. And so this distorts your perception of what is the highest good. You can't see the highest good without infinite intelligence and infinite consciousness because you can't see infinite number of moves ahead. You might say, well, Leo, how is, how is my mother dying from cancer? How does that serve the highest good of the universe? Well, you're right. From your human perspective, you can't see it because you're only thinking of your little local situation. But from the highest position, there are many reasons why your mother dying of cancer would actually be in the highest service of the universe. And not necessarily, I'm not saying that it's because she was evil or a sinful woman that she should die of cancer. That's not the reason why. Uh, I'll give you an example of how you can sort of justify this from God's point of view. Here's how it would look from God's point of view. Like, your mother, for example, might have gotten the cancer because she ate a lifetime of poor food, junk food, food filled with plastics, heavy metals, and other toxins, pesticides, for example. If your mother is 60 years old and she ate all this kind of garbage throughout her whole life, then she might get cancer. That's quite, quite reasonable. Now you say, well, Leo, what kind of God would allow such food to be created? Wouldn't it be in the highest goodness of the universe to not allow such food to be created? But actually, no, there is a higher good that you're not seeing. Who created that food? Was it God? Not really. Who created that food is humans. Humans, scientists, engineers, business people, marketers created and marketed that food. And they did it for their own selfish purposes. And they had the freedom. See, God gave them the freedom to create whatever kind of food they wanted to create. So the highest good in this case is that humans are given a certain latitude, a certain freedom to construct our societies however we want. God gives us that freedom. We can create a society in which we have beautiful, organic, pesticide-free food available for free to everybody. We could construct that kind of society, but we don't. Why not? Because we're selfish. Because we're biased. Because nobody cares about these sorts of things. In our society, in our culture, people don't care about nutrition and health and organic stuff and pesticide-free stuff. What we care about is cheap, fast, salty, fatty, sugary, delicious. Now you might say, well, well, Leo, why did God give us these sorts of impulses to crave the worst kinds of foods? Wouldn't it be nicer, you know, wouldn't God be more perfect? If God was all loving, then he would allow us to eat any kind of garbage, to eat chocolate ice cream by the bucket load every single day and not gain any weight and not get any diseases from it. Wouldn't that be the best kind of God? But again, you're looking at it from a very selfish position. The answer is no. The best kind of God is the kind of God that allows you to eat whatever you want. And then if you want to be conscious about what you eat, then you're responsible and you're conscious and you don't eat the garbage. In fact, not only do you not eat the garbage, you don't even shop at those stores that sell the garbage. And in fact, you, can, can, you don't even... You don't even build a society where such stores exist. You don't even build companies that produce this kind of garbage food because everyone in that society is too conscious and too caring about others, too loving of others to subject them to this poisonous food. See, as a human, you want God to do all the heavy lifting for you. You might say like, well, Leo, why didn't God just construct a society where everything was already perfect, where the food was perfect, the healthcare was perfect, the business systems were perfect, the political system was perfect. Why didn't God just construct a utopia for us? And the answer is because God has delegated its creative capacities to you, to us as humans, so that we could construct whatever we wanted to. That is the higher good. Think of it like this. 
if you had a child that you really loved and cared about, what would it mean to facilitate this child's development such that the child grows into a mature, healthy, responsible, creative, conscious being that lived up to its highest potential. How would you facilitate that as a, as a parent? Well, here's how you wouldn't. If you tell the child precisely everything that he needs to do, step by step by step, and you beat him with a whip if he doesn't do it, and you force him to do all the studying, all the reading, all the everything that is supposed to be all the right choices, you force him into the right choice all the time, such that he never has any choice at all in his whole life. You tell him exactly where to go, which friends to have, which foods to eat, which books to read and which books not to read, which schools to go to, which parties to go to or not go to, which businesses to be a part of. Basically, you're gonna live his whole life for him. If you do that, assuming that you have infinite intelligence, then yeah, the child would live a perfect life. But then, don't you see what would even be the point of living that life? That would not be a life worth living. The whole point of life is that you have to figure it out for yourself by making mistakes. And that's what us humans are doing as we're building our societies, as we're constructing our food menus at restaurants, as we're filling and stocking our grocery stores. We're figuring it out on our own. That's what makes life meaningful and interesting and worthwhile because it's from that that you get growth. If God solved all of our problems, we wouldn't even need to be alive. You see? So the highest good is not for God to stock your grocery store shelves with perfect organic food. The highest good is for us to recognize that we should correct ourselves and do it for ourselves. Don't ask God to stock the grocery store with the best food. Do it yourself. Do it as a society. Let's do it if we really care about it. And if we don't care about it, then why are we complaining? What is there to complain about? You see, the vast majority of mankind's problems are self-created. And the way that mankind evolves, the way society evolves, the way culture evolves is by making these sorts of mistakes and learning from our mistakes. This is the whole purpose of life, is to exercise one's consciousness and to realize that it's insufficient. Selfish consciousness, needy, attached consciousness is insufficient. To live the best life. And by becoming conscious of that, that is what gets you to surrender your selfishness and to evolve and to grow until eventually you surrender enough of your selfishness that you literally become God. You see, that's the highest good. And you cannot become God by being forced into it. You can only become God by accepting yourself as God. You might say, Leo, why, why did God make it so difficult to become God? Why couldn't... Why couldn't it just be like, I snap my fingers and I become God? That Wouldn't that be nicer? Wouldn't that be a better world to live in? No, because the whole point of it is that you have to go through this whole ordeal to realize the limitations of selfishness. That's what all of life is about. Life is just a simulation to show you that if you're going to be selfish and attached and needy and biased and untruthful and manipulative, then you're going to live such a shitty life and you're going to suffer for it. So either do that or wise up and stop being so fucking selfish. And then, ta-da, life goes great. 
But you see, selfishness cannot be removed from you by force. You have to be allowed to relinquish your own selfishness of your own free will. Because you see, at the highest level, infinite will is identical with goodness and with love. Goodness and love have to be willed. They can't be forced upon you. Because at the highest level, there's nothing that can force God. God has to will to be love. God has to will to be good. Nobody, because at the highest level, there's nobody other than God to force it to be anything that it doesn't want to be. So it has to want it. So for you to become God, you have to want it. You have to want to love. But how can you want to love if you're so fucking selfish and afraid and attached and biased and manipulative and untruthful? You can't love when you're untruthful because love is truth. So all the shit that's happening is our own creation. If you don't like it, stop creating it. Start taking responsibility for how you're creating your life, for what you're willing into your life with the limited will that you do have. Start taking responsibility for how you define yourself. Most people don't take responsibility for how they define themselves as a human. They offload that responsibility onto science or biology or onto religion. When you say, oh, Leo, but science tells me I'm a human, that's you offloading your responsibility of self-definition onto some stupid human called a scientist who, for whatever reason, you have turned into your pope. the Pope of materialism. See, you can't awaken to your own God self when you are offloading your sovereignty and authority onto other people or organizations or institutions or culture. That's the fundamental problem. Go check out my episode called How Authority Works. Very crucial for you to understand what I'm talking about. In subtle, unconscious ways, you are offloading the responsibility and your own sovereignty and authority onto others. Authority figures, whether it's scientists or religious people or gurus or new age people or YouTubers or your parents or your boss or your coworkers, somebody, and you're blaming others. You're not taking responsibility over the fact that you're constructing the entire universe. So that's another huge problem here, is that for you to reach the highest levels of God consciousness, you're going to have to take full responsibility for everything that you've created in your life. And most people are in such denial that they have created anything bad in their life, they want to blame somebody else for it. It's always somebody else's fault. But what if the highest truth was that you constructed your life? All of it. And it's no one's fault but yours. That's one of the biggest obstacles that keeps people from waking up, is that they simply refuse to take responsibility for their epistemology, for their metaphysics, for how they think about science, for how they define themselves, for how they think, how they emote, how they relate to other humans, and so on. And as long as you're going to be denying responsibility and authority and sovereignty, you're never going to realize that you're God. So again, does God have free will? It does, but in a paradoxical sense, it doesn't because all of its free will has been given to infinite love. Now you might say, but Leo, that, that seems so limiting, but it's not really limiting <laughs> because there's nothing higher than this. There's no other purpose towards which to put your will. 
but towards the manifestation of infinite love. So it is the highest purpose. There's nothing higher than it. So in this sense, God is perfectly content with its choice. It has no other choice but to be love. From a human point of view, it might not make a lot of sense and it might seem kind of lame, like, oh, Leo, it's all just love, but like, you're telling me I can't manipulate reality and help my mother if she's sick and so on. That seems kind of lame. Seems like it's powerless. Seems like God is weak. Well, that's how it looks from your limited vantage point. If you had an infinite vantage point, it would not be weak. It would be the highest strength. But because you're selfish and all you care about is your little local corner of reality, from your vantage point in your little local corner of reality, yeah, it might seem like that is weakness because you don't get your selfish little way. But actually, the true weakness would be to sacrifice the entire universe for the sake of your little corner of reality and your personal petty needs and wants and attachments. That would be the real travesty. That would be the true weakness. And, of course, God will never, will never allow that. Now, that does not mean that you as a little human cannot manipulate reality. You can. You can manipulate reality to certain degrees. Very limited degrees, you can manipulate stuff. Maybe you can invent a new drug that will save your mother's life from cancer. That's possible. And there's nothing wrong with that, per se. But remember that even if you cure your mother's cancer, that's not going to be any of your problems. That's just like one obstacle that you've dodged as a hummingbird within this giant hurricane that is constantly, endlessly swirling and it's never going to end. So you save your mother's life. Okay, fine. But then you got to go deal with some other bullshit the next day that you won't be able to manipulate your way out of. You see, so this manipulation strategy is a finite strategy. It's a finite game. You can play it to some degree, but it's ultimately going to collapse and fail at some point. And so you can't really get true fulfillment or freedom from suffering through that manipulative method. You need to start playing the infinite game rather than the finite game. And then your actions become less manipulations and more just expressions of God's intelligence, goodness, love, and will. By aligning yourself, by becoming a superconductor for God's intelligence. See, when you become that conscious, what happens is that you enter into this supernatural flow state where you are flowing with God's intelligence, you're flowing with the entire universe, and then all of your actions just automatically become imbued with the highest intelligence and the highest love and the highest goodness. That doesn't mean you're going to survive. They could still nail you to a cross and kill you. Your fellow humans can. And a bear can still maul you if you're walking through a forest or whatever. But see, the thing is, is that when you're aligned with the highest intelligence and love, it's not guaranteed, but for the most part, you're not just going to stumble like a fool through the forest where bears exist. You're going to be intelligent enough. God is going to grant you enough intelligence to recognize that, hey, you know, if I'm hiking through this forest, there's bears here, so I better be careful. I better pack some bear spray, and you'll pack some bear spray, and that will protect you against a bear attack. Or maybe you'll just be smart enough not to even walk through that part of the forest because you know there are bears there. Whereas a fool who's constantly manipulating reality is detached from God's intelligence. He's just going to stumble into that forest, forget the bear spray, act cocky, and then the bears will eat him. See? So the whole point of spiritual work is to empty yourself of ego and raise your consciousness so much that you become an ever better vessel or superconductor for God's intelligence. And then that acts through you, and that is what runs the show. That is what makes all the decisions. You don't need to sit and rack your ego mind over every decision anymore. You can act with a certain flow, with a certain effortlessness, 
because you know there's a higher force guiding you. And this higher force is not just some woo-woo bullshit. It is what you are. You are guiding yourself. It's not even God that's guiding you. You just are the whole universe flowing as God, as yourself, your higher self. And then life just magically seems to click and to work. Just like when you're riding a bicycle, see, the best way to ride a bicycle is in a state of complete flow. You're flowing, you're pedaling, you're balancing, you're turning the wheel, you're hitting the brakes at just the right times, you're switching the gears, and you're doing it all without a lot of deliberation. You're not sitting there racking your brain about, should I balance one inch to the left or to the right in order to keep riding this bicycle? No, you're just, you're flowing on the bicycle. You've mastered the bicycle. You're part of the bicycle. It's like you and the bicycle are one. And not just you and the bicycle, but you, the bicycle, the road you're driving on, all the obstacles in front of you, all of it is just one gestalt and it's all just one flow and it's working perfectly when it's working. But if you're first learning how to ride a bicycle, you're going to be rusty at it and you're going to have to think about it more deliberately and you have to rationally tell yourself, you know, which way to turn and things how to do. And that's going to be clunky. It's clunky. It doesn't look smooth. It's not mastery because you're not in flow with it yet. It takes a lot of practice. It also takes getting out of your own way. Because see, if you're so afraid of riding a bicycle that every time you get on a bicycle, you keep thinking about how you're going to die on this bicycle. If that's your mind state, you're not going to become a great bicyclist because your fear will cause an interference pattern. You'll be getting in your own way because rather than freeing up space in your mind just to flow and to be relaxed, you're going to be in this tense neurotic state, this paranoid state, always thinking about how you're going to crash and kill yourself around the next turn. And that's going to make your whole bicycling or uh, career uh, uh, a grind and an ordeal. You see? So there you go. <laughs> now you understand how control works, how freedom works, how will works. Everything's been answered. <laughs> the only problem is that you have to actually now become directly conscious of this for yourself. And if it's anything like, like what happened with me, it's going to take you hundreds of awakenings to realize this. I don't see very many spiritual teachers properly teaching what will is. And I think that's simply because they haven't become conscious enough to recognize what it really is. Because this requires extremely holistic levels of God realization that are going to be very difficult to reach through basic meditative practices or self-inquiry practices. You're going to have to go much deeper than that to reach it. So, I wish you good luck. I hope one day you realize what will truly is. Don't stop this work until you become directly conscious of what will is. And that means you have to become conscious of how everything that is happening right now is your own will being manifest. Physical reality is the manifestation of your will. If you're not conscious of that, then you're not truly awake. <laughs>